Hello, everyone. My name is Martin Rasser, Senior Fellow and Director of the Technology National Security Program at the Center for New American Security. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to today's event, a conversation with Mike Brown, Director of the Defense Innovation Unit at the Department of Defense. Um, many of you are very familiar with Mike's work, of course. Um, he has served for just about four years at DIU now, and it's a distinct pleasure to welcome him back to the Center for New American Security. Amongst the many roles that he served in his career, uh, most recently, uh, prior to DIU, he was a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow at the Department of Defense, um, and he also served as the CEO of Symantec. Uh, so Mike, it's a distinct pleasure to welcome you to the stage. There Great you to are. Be here. Great to see you. Great to see you. Um, and just um, for everyone in the audience, uh, we do want this to be interactive. So I want uh, to give you the opportunity to ask some questions as well. So you can do that in the chat box below the video, or if you're uh, watching on social media, you can uh, tweet us your question using the hashtag CNES2022. Um, so let me uh, jump right in. Um, so Mike, we, we've talked about this quite a bit in the past, right? About how the United States is engaged in the technology competition it's, uh, taking place in a highly globalized and in industry dominated ecosystem. Two specific attributes of the, the current context are the rapid pace of technological change and the global diffusion of technology. Now you've laid out two strategies to cope with that reality. Um, first, you've developed a hedge strategy uh, to support integrated deterrence. So I'd like to hear from you how um, your proposed strategic framework would help to minimize the risk of technology surprise. And how does that then integrate with the scattered ongoing efforts uh, to identify, adopt, and deploy emerging technologies? Great, well, let's start with what the hedge strategy is. Uh, the hedge strategy is really a hedge to complement the existing large weapons platforms that the Defense Department invests so much money in, aircraft carriers, F-35, et cetera. So the hedge is really recognizing the fact that uh, we really would benefit by making a part of our strategy explicitly the development of other capabilities, complementary capabilities, those that could provide some surprise. Uh, why do we need a surprise here? Uh, because our adversaries, in, in some cases, have stolen uh, designs for large weapons platforms, China in particular. And then our adversaries, uh, uh, China and others, have studied our you know, tactics, techniques, procedures, our way of fighting for years, because the U.S. has been so active in a number of conflicts around the globe. So if we are to bring an element of surprise to a conflict, uh, a future conflict, we're going to need some additional capabilities that mean we're not just fielding the same weapons platforms in the same ways. Uh, so I started working on this with um, Admiral Lawrence Selby, who leads the director of Office of Naval Research. And we've uh, basically devised this head strategy as a way to complement those platforms. And the head strategy really consists of uh, three elements. One, as we talked about, making it more formal and more systematic the development of these alternative capabilities, which by their nature, in, in our mind, would be commercial, because we need to have uh, emphasis on getting them fielded to complement our weapons platforms sooner rather than later, meaning in one to two years, not in one to two decades. The second would be speed of development. So how can we make sure that we get this capability to our own warfighters and we start experimenting and developing our own uh, uh, new uh, tactics and procedures. A good example of this is happening right now with something the Navy is fielding called Task Force 59, uh, which is looking at all the autonomous platforms that are there and how would we work with those autonomous platforms to think about them as a system. Think how important this would be to cover the tremendous distances we're talking about in the Pacific, uh, where you've got autonomous platforms that complement what you've got as today primarily a manned platform um, a fielding of, of capabilities. And the third element of the strategy after the head, what, you know, basically what hedge is commercial capability brought to bear. We're seeing that so effectively used in Ukraine right now. 
sense of urgency about getting that into warfighters' hands. So we develop our own new uh, tactics and procedures. The third element would be kind of an architecture for what kind of capabilities we're looking for. And we've developed an acronym called SUMS, uh, small, unmanned for the autonomous capability, many to emphasize the resiliency we need because we can't assume in a conflict with you know peer level adversaries that we're not gonna lose some capability. So resilience is a very important. And smart weapons, which really mean embedded sensors. Uh, this is already, uh, if you look across what's happening at DOD, uh, it's happening in a variety of places. I just don't think there's the emphasis on it. I've heard, for example, that there are capabilities being developed in special access or classified programs. By their nature, those aren't uh, broadly applicable. People don't know about them. We're not fielding them at a, at a large scale. So uh, Admiral Selby and I feel that a head strategy would be a great complement to the integrated deterrence um, strategy that's incorporated in the in the upcoming national defense strategy that's been primarily written but not yet released in an unclassified version why do you feel that lack of emphasis uh is is omnipresent right now well i think there's a lot of experimentation i think you see examples of some of these concepts uh you, you certainly see that uh, as i mentioned with something like task force 59 i just don't see them being uh, budgeted for on a large scale basis and an emphasis on how are we going to bring in the commercial technology we need um, at sufficient scale to change the capabilities of the Defense Department. So we're talking about having this be a significant part of our defense capability, not just uh, experimentation at the edges. A related strategy that you've articulated is this fast follower strategy. Can you tell us a little bit about what that entails and how it uh, interlinks with the hedge strategy that you just described. Right. Well, the the point of the hedge is that we're bringing commercial capability. You know, think about small drones, uh, AI capability um, that will complement the large weapons platforms. If we're bringing in that commercial technology, we really need a way to ingest that faster. So this is driven from my experience leading DIU. We really have the same acquisition system uh, to bring in large weapons platforms that we do to bring in AI software packages. What do I mean by that? We start with requirements, then we go through an acquisition process. Sometimes we use some of the new tools that DIU is pioneering, like other leveraging other transaction authorities, a process we've invented called commercial solutions opening, but sometimes we don't. We use the federal acquisition regulations. And then of course we have the very uh, cumbersome budgeting process where it takes roughly two and a half years to program a dollar of spending. Um, so that's already longer than the development cycle of some of the technologies that we're talking about. So if we combine that requirements, acquisition and budgeting system, uh, which is the paradigm for bringing a new capability in the Defense Department today, it's not really adapted for fast moving commercial technologies that many of which are coming from the consumer world. So we have a 1960s era paradigm that Secretary McNamara developed which is called the PPB&E process for those following it, programming, planning, budgeting, and execution. Uh, and if we use that uh, to bring in commercial capabilities, which are being developed quite rapidly, uh, then we're gonna continuously be behind our adversaries. So that combination of requirements, acquisition, and budgeting would need to be rethought. So how do I propose that we rethink that? With commercial technologies, the good news is we don't need a requirements process. The commercial market is developing uh, small drones, digital wearables, cyber and AI tools. So we don't need a requirements process. We just need to validate a need. That can be very quick. Uh, we're talking weeks or months, not a decade or two, which is two decades, what it took the F-35 in the requirements or design part of that to program. So that is just not competitive with the, uh, the rate of technology change today. So requirements, rethink. Acquisition, let's use the tools that are available. Uh, DIU's pioneered some of those. They're not being used on a widespread basis across DOD. They're being used on an increasing basis, which is great to see, but relative to all of the defense procurement that's happening, it's still a very small part of, the, of how we're acquiring the things that we acquire at DOD. And then the budgeting process, we definitely need a more agile, flexible process uh, Agile, we need to process that basically could happen in a year, not two and a half years, which is what it takes today. 
And we need flexibility so that senior leaders at DOD can move money more quickly to address emerging threats and to take advantage of technology capabilities that happen within a defense planning cycle. So I think that combination of uh, rethinking requirements acquisition and budgeting would allow us to ingest uh, technology from the commercial world a lot faster at DOD, which is really what we need to do to modernize the force. My boss, the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, just listed 14 technologies critical to national security. 11 of those are commercial or being led by the private sector. So we have to have a different way, given the importance of those commercial technologies, to figure out how we're going to accelerate their adoption at DOD. And I think the fast follower strategy helps to point the way. So there's a lot of movement afoot right now to uh, reform the PBBE process. Uh, do you feel confident that the department will get it right, given what you laid out? Well, I think there's a tremendous interest in uh, reforming it. Uh, I'm speaking later today to the PPBE commissioners uh, with some ideas on how we could have that role model speed and agility. Uh, I think there's a big step in front of us uh, to get Congress to agree to that because they'll need to be part of that. Uh, we, we're, to, in order to move faster, we've got to uh, simplify this process. So an NDAA with a thousand uh, sections to it requiring 720 reports from DOD back to Congress means we're continuing to look backward and address what was in the NDAA last year rather than looking forward to what are the emerging threats, what new technology can help us. So uh, I'm confident that there's a recognition that we need to change. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the department and with the Congress to uh, take the recommendations from PPBD Commission and move them forward. Okay, fantastic. Well, we'll stay tuned on, uh, on the progress there. Um, let, let's turn to Ukraine for a moment. So one fascinating aspect of the conflict uh, in my mind has been the use of commercial technologies. Um, what initial lessons are you drawing from the conflict, uh, acknowledging that you know things are unfolding rapidly, it's still early days? Um, what implications do you see for the next fight? Yeah, I think we're seeing the character of war fighting changing before our eyes, and we're seeing Russia field a you know 20th century industrialized force. Granted, they have other problems, uh, the use of conscripts, the very low morale, uh, the corruption in their system, which has probably bled off a lot of the dollars that were spent, that were allocated for modernizing that force. So we're seeing that force come up against a technology savvy uh, country, obviously with incredible commitment, but is using commercial technology to uh, asymmetric effect. Just give you a couple of examples where DIU has been involved and we're only a part of what is being fielded in Ukraine. Commercial satellite imagery. So we started working at DIU on synthetic aperture radar or the ability to see through clouds and at night uh, five years ago and started working with some of the vendors who are developing that technology. Now we have capability through these commercial satellites and low earth orbit to basically see um, in a different uh, type of sensor than our optical government satellites uh, that allows us to get pretty good resolution uh, down to a third of a meter. So you can see the, the radar images there give you pretty good fidelity to where our Russian forces. Um, and we've uh, not only provided great strategic awareness through that, this is actually fielded through the National Reconnaissance Office, NRO, but the vendors that we brought through this commercial capability is also being made available to uh, Ukrainians for tactical advantage. So one of the great things about using commercial technology, uh, which applies to the head strategy we talked about a moment ago, is it can be shared easily with uh, with allies and partners. In this case, it uh, can be shared with, uh, with Ukraine so that they can see where the Russians are. And it's given them much closer to real-time awareness uh, because they don't have to go through a process of um, exploitation and dissemination that the intelligence community has typically used, intelligence community has typically used to get um, information from satellites uh, to allies and partners. So again, you could see something as soon as the image was taken as opposed to uh, a couple of days later. Very important for the advantage that's been established, uh, you know, as the Ukrainians drove back the Russians from Kyiv. Um, so commercial satellite imagery is just one example of uh, where we have worked. Another would be small drones. Another would be uh, some uh, communications capability, secure communications capability. 
which many of the Russian generals wish they had that used their cell phone, which they didn't realize was gonna be a geolocating uh, device uh, on their whereabouts. So there are many other technologies that are being used. We're seeing autonomy used for, for great effect here in Ukraine. Um, and the combination of these means that there's new warfighting capabilities uh, again, a tech savvy uh, uh, set of fighters can use these for asymmetric effect. So again, character of war is changing and is not just about the large platform. So I think it's an illustration of uh, the head strategy uh, basically in practice here. And we are very excited to provide some of the commercial capabilities and opportunities for vendors uh, with folks we had worked with. One, one more thing I'll mention with Ukraine, uh, an AI tool, one that we did using a prize challenge for humanitarian assistance disaster recovery. So uh, we did a prize challenge a few years ago to be able to use AI tools on uh, these images, SAR images, uh, to be able to assess infrastructure damage from wildfires or flooding. So we use that uh, to help first responders in hurricanes and to support um, those fir first responders for California wildfires. That same technology using AI uh, to basically see what damage has been done can be used for battlefield damage assessment in Ukraine and is being used for that. So uh, as soon as the image is taken, uh, we can then give uh, a color coded view of where is the damage and how significant is it? Um, something that would have taken much longer to do um, a couple of years ago. Oh, that's a great example. Um, so let's see, we've got some incoming questions from members of our audience. Let me uh, start with a question from Don, uh, John Harper, who's with Defense Scoop. And uh, John would like to know, does DIU plan to add any new technology focus areas beyond the six you're currently focused on? If so, what might those be? So uh, energy is our newest uh, portfolio. In fact, we added that about a year and a half ago, and it's our rap most rapidly growing uh, area, given the uh, importance of uh, what we do to have alternative sources of energy, save energy, so this is not just about climate change, but it's also about resiliency of the force. How do you make sure that we're not tied to uh, very long supply chains uh, that you know are, are basically getting gasoline to faraway places? Or, uh, so uh, both the how do we conserve energy? How do we use batteries more effectively? Uh, battery form factors, new battery chemistries, synthetic fuels. Uh, this is an exploding area of interest for Department of Defense. So that's our newest area. We continue to incubate a couple of other technology areas within our existing portfolio. So I'll give you an example of that. 3D printing with concrete. So we call it cons constructive scale additive manufacturing. So this is a technology being pioneered in our autonomy portfolio. How could you basically print structures, barracks, bridges, hangars on Pacific islands using local uh, soil, not shipping bags of concrete mix across the Pacific? So that technology is available today. We pioneered that with the Marines uh, and it's being used to build, I think, uh, one of the largest barracks uh, at Fort Bliss right now. So very interesting uh, technology. Another would be uh, augmented reality. So we've used that in a project we call Pilot Training Next. So we've developed simulators that can be used for pilot uh, training uh, that are available for on the order of $50,000 instead of the expensive simulators, it can be one to $2 million. So think how that expands the availability of uh, that as a training tool for pilots. And as we know, there's a pilot shortage across the country, not only for commercial airlines, but also for our military pilots. So making sure that we've got a better way to train those pilots, which frankly is not just based on time, but have I mastered a concept or a skill uh, that allows us to provide customized uh, training and also uh, more time in the simulator than we would have before. So those are some examples of other technologies that we're watching and are being managed within our existing portfolios. Excellent. Here's a question from uh, Brianna Riley from uh, Insight Defense. And uh, Brianna would like to know, as part of Director Brown's fast follower strategy, he has included a coordination with allies tenant. Does he see the new AUKUS agreement as one potential vehicle for sourcing and selling commercial tech to and from Australia, for instance? Any examples he can share? Yeah, Brianna, thanks for that uh, question. Yes, uh, while I didn't mention it before, I think uh, collaborating with allies and partners clearly has to be part of our ongoing strategy and is as part of what uh, is meant by integrated deterrence. 
Uh, but the beauty of commercial technology is it can be so easily shared. So this is why I think there's a unique role for DIU and others that are bringing in commercial technology into the department. AUKUS creates a new uh, you know, ability to rethink some of the constraints that we have of working with allies and partners uh, and be able to go a lot faster there. I've recommended uh, that DIU be given the mandate to source technology from allies, in particular, uh, Australia and the UK. Uh, we already can do that, but we don't have any outreach uh, today for companies in those countries. In other words, DIU has made awards to about 15 or 16 companies from our allies and partners. So we're not limited in that way, but there's no outreach to let folks in Australia, companies in Australia or the UK know that this is a possibility. And we would definitely like to see more of their companies working in some of these advanced technology areas uh, apply to uh, DIU projects. On the flip side, once we've qualified a capability, uh, we should have the uh, streamlined process to be able to sell that uh, to uh, UK or Australian militaries and other allies. So imagine a world where we're outreach, outreaching to make sure we're attracting the best in our competitions makes the process more competitive. And then for those companies that are selected, whether they're US or from allies, they have the advantage of selling to allied military. So I think that would be a great addition to what we're doing today. A few years ago, um, some of my CNAS colleagues uh, made a recommendation to open DIU outposts in other countries. Is that something that you think would be uh, a realistic step in the future? Well, some already have. So uh, the UK already has uh, innovation office, their uh, equivalent of uh, DIU, and we're working with them. Uh, I think there with, uh, will be an opportunity to make those relationships tighter uh, in the future if we're working under a framework like AUKUS. Uh, Australia has not done that, but I know they're studying that right now, and we'd be delighted to be working with innovation units from our allies. Let's face it. The, the whole idea behind DIU was how do we strengthen that relationship with the folks outside the traditional suppliers so we're attracting the best of the innovation ecosystems basically around the world is what we're talking about here. We're, we're doing that at DIU within the U.S., um, both through our physical offices and outreach that we can do uh, over the web. But it would be great to expand that to be an international network of companies, too. So I'd love to see our allies and partners uh, form their own uh, innovation units that we could work with. Nicholas has a related question on uh, engaging with allies, and this one is specifically on the uh, National Technology Industrial Base, or NTIP for short. Um, Nick would like to know uh, what kind of bottlenecks to collaboration in the context of NTIP um, that, that you see and, and how we could address those. Yeah, I think our relationships are, uh, st are structured. So if we think about the structure of how do we get something done with an ally or partner for a previous era, um, one where it hasn't been, frankly, as important to collaborate as closely. So we, for example, are in a process right now to negotiate a data sharing agreement with Australia and the UK under the AUKUS framework. Why not start over and think about how could we combine people dollars, ideas, <laughs> so that going well beyond data sharing, we're actually developing some capability together. If nothing else, demonstrating commercial capability uh, from, from vendors that we can there share uh, uh, readily uh, with AUKUS partners. So we're not doing that today. We're, we're relying on some of the same frameworks, kind of understandable why that would happen. But if we lean forward, we could basically develop all new frameworks for the closest allies that uh, that we want to collaborate with, which would certainly include AUKUS, and I think you'd expand that to include Canada easily, one of our NTIB partners. So I think our processes, how we document what we're able to do, uh, it could use with some updating. Darius has a question on AI systems. Uh, so Darius would like to know, does uh, DIU give any guidance as to a developer's process of building AI systems? And is there a structural framework DIU wants to see in use for developers and their products? Well, Darius, thanks so much for that question. Yeah, we have spent a fair amount of time taking the ethical principles, which were developed by the Defense Innovation Board and then adopted by the Secretary of Defense and said, what's a practical guide for what vendors should think about 
when they want to uh, uh, produce a system for the Department of Defense software and apply these principles. So we call that responsible AI guidelines. You can download a copy at our, uh, at our website, which is diu.mil. Uh, and we're using that actively with vendors uh, of our AI projects today to make sure we're working through those issues so that when you have a, uh, an AI solution, it conforms to those principles, which really involves a lot of thinking up front. It's all about the planning of, does the system have bias? How would we remove that? Um, how do we make sure that, uh, you know, uh, we are ad adopting these principles in a way that's practical for companies, but also completely meets the intent of, of DOD? Uh, so Sean Carberry has an uh, observation. He said that uh, your predecessors, uh, the, the previous director of DIU, said many of the same things, right, that you're articulating today, the need for acquisition reform, agile budgeting, emphasis on commercial pro uh, products. Sean would like to know what, what have been the barriers to progress and what can be done differently going forward to solve these problems? Well, I'm pleased to say that uh, my predecessor, Raj Shah, is on the ppb &E Commission. So now he's in a position to uh, have some impact. So I look forward to presenting to him uh, in, in a few hours here. Uh, I think the biggest uh, barriers have been the resource focus at DOD. Uh, kind of naturally, we are focused on the capabilities that we are developing within DOD. And this this is historical in nature. So DOD, if you go back uh, 60 years to the 1960s, we were developing a lot of the technology that we needed uh, to modernize the force at that time. Uh, in fact, uh, between DOD's research budget and the defense primes at that time, many more than, than there are today, that was 36% of global R&D. So a lot of that technology development happening within our own ecosystem. If you look at that number today, it's 3%, and I had to round up to make it 3%. So, so much has changed in terms of a lot of the technology we need is in the commercial world and is happening with allies and partners. There's much more R&D happening outside the U.S. The basic system of how we acquire and ingest technology, uh, develop capability for DoD has not changed. That's what we were talking about before with the fast follower strategy. It comes from the McNamara era. So we really need to rethink that process uh, to reduce those barriers. So one barrier is a lot of our resources are spent on the technology we're developing uniquely. I mean, we all want uh, hypersonics, directed energy, and the other technologies that uh, DOD is developing uniquely so we can be competitive with adversaries. But if you think about the tremendous uh, other technologies, so whether it's AI and cyber tools, autonomous systems, uh, digital wearables like I'm wearing today that can tell me whether I'm coming down with infectious disease uh, 24 to 72 hours before I feel the first symptom. We need technologies like that uh, to modernize our force today. They're coming from outside DOD and we don't have the, I'd say the resource allocation within DOD to say, okay, we need to be focused more on those uh, outside technologies. And then the other would be what we talked about. We don't have a process uh, to bring those in. So DIU was set up to do that. I'd say we have successfully demonstrated the ability to do that. We've brought in 50 capabilities at DIU and introduced 100 new vendors uh, uh, over the last uh, seven years that DIU has been in existence. So I would say we built the two lane road uh, there, which needs to be a super highway, uh, because in that time, we probably made available so on the order of $5 billion of contract value for those vendors that we've brought in. And the DOD in that time has probably spent a trillion dollars. So you can see we're pretty small. I would love to see DIU moving the needle, uh, which means more people adopting the kind of things that we do, uh, leveraging other transaction authority would be an example, and the department to move faster on something like the fast follower strategy so we can ingest a lot more commercial technology to modernize the force. So I think those are the two barriers. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ali Crawford has a question on prize competition. And Ali would like to know how you view prize competitions as a vehicle for in incentivizing and sourcing innovation. And could they be used more? Definitely they could. Uh, DARPA uses prize challenge. We do. Uh, probably other uh, groups within uh, DOD do. Uh, very effective. Uh, we've used this uh, to 
basically show the benefits of the SAR technology that we talked about before, synthetic aperture radar, and what are the algorithms that uh, could be open sourced uh, and improve whatever our state of the art is within the government to provide more, more capability. So I talked before about how we develop something for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, uh, responding to wildfires and floods. Now that's being used in Ukraine. Uh, a quick example of the most recent prize challenge, uh, looking at that same SAR imagery to see, can we detect illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing? So uh, as many might know that uh, there are uh, countries that send their fishing vessels to other countries' waters, China as do, does this more than any other country, uh, and they'll turn their uh, communication uh, system, their transponder, which is a system called AIS, they'll turn that off. So that would look dark uh, if they're in another country's waters and then they're fishing illegally and, uh, you know, reaping the benefits of another country's uh, territorial waters. So we've been able to uh, show that we can identify the likely targets of that illegal fishing 70% of the time using uh, what was an open sourced algorithm on a standard data set. And that now is being fielded. So uh, that will be uh, up and available to the US Coast Guard. That's one of the most important missions. Uh, and that because it's commercial technology can also be shared with allies and partners. So the US Coast Guard will be supporting other navies and coast guards that are trying to interdict that illegal uh, unreported fishing activity in their waters. Big, big supporter of the prize challenges. Excellent, excellent. Um, Question from Jennifer on technology readiness levels, um, uh, TRL for short. Uh, so what TRL do companies have to be uh, at to prototype for DIU? And how do you evaluate the technology you invest in before making the investment? Yeah, so Jennifer, uh, we basically uh, are looking at TRL seven to nine. So a company has to have uh, basically a, uh, the capability to provide a prototype uh, for us that can be tested, whether that's software or hardware. And then that goes through a uh, testing plan that we develop with DOD mission partners, our customers within uh, DOD, to basically say, how are we going to know that this commercial technology works in a military environment? So we never buy things based on say so, a, a PowerPoint presentation. There's always a test plan that we do with a DOD mission partner. And we can rely on their expertise, ours, DIU is, in fact, staffed with active duty military, reservists, um, civilians that have expertise in technology. And then we can complement that as we do with folks from FFRDCs, national labs, uh, any technical expertise uh, that might be needed in the department. So assembling that technical team is very important, both in scoping the project as well as in evaluating uh, the vendors and their solutions that they provide. Uh, Mark Magnier, who's a reporter with the South China Morning Post, uh, is asking specifically about uh, China's capabilities in a lot of these areas where we're discussing. Um, based on what, what you can say in, in the public setting, how far advanced is China in many of these quasi-commercial technologies uh, that you've referenced today? Well, in a nutshell, Mark, uh, as you probably know, very advanced. So uh, China's national strategy is to displace the U.S. as a technology superpower. Uh, they've recognized the importance of producing more of the high technology goods they uh, want in their own economy within China. That's the Made in China 2025 plan that came out in 2015. They're not accomplishing all of the goals of that plan, but they're making incredible progress. Big focus on semiconductors, uh, advanced uh, communications capability and look at what Huawei has done there. Uh, satellites, they've done more rocket launches and satellite launches than we did uh, last year. Uh, they have uh, fielded twice as many electric vehicles as the US has and are developing quite a bit of the lithium ion battery technology required. Want to uh, source that all the way to the lithium mines. So I'm quite concerned about China's advancement in commercial technology and what does that imply for their military capability we all know they've employed a civil military fusion strategy which makes every commercial innovation available to their military uh, military doesn't even need to ask for it think how different that is in the u.s where we have organizations like diu which are trying to set up the incentives uh, to encourage more commercial companies to provide capability to the department of defense 
So they're very far along. Uh, they're ahead of us in some technologies, uh, and they're giving us a run for our money in other technologies like AI and quantum. So this story isn't written. It's being developed right now, but we have to make sure that we are making the right long-term investments in the U.S., basic research, um, the USICA and America Competes Act, very important to get passed so that we can make sure we're making the right investments for the long term um, to make sure we've got, uh, you know, uh, current, uh, if not superior technology that we can feel important for our commercial economic prosperity and very important for national security. We have uh, two questions uh, focused on energy. Uh, so I'll, I'll combine those so we can uh, tackle them at once. So uh, the first question is from Samantha, and she um, is asking what technological development you are most excited about within uh, the broad category of energy. And then Jeannie had a more specific question um, responding to your mention of energy comfort, uh, conservation. Um, what are some specific focus areas in that field? And do you have any examples of top priorities there? Um, and then as well as any uh, public documents or, or data that uh, that you could cite that, uh, that she could look up uh, would be helpful. So I'd say in general, I'm excited about the increased focus uh, in this area for Department of Defense. We are the largest energy consumer in the world. So what, whatever we can do uh, that conserves or uses uh, greener fuels is going to have an impact on the world. So uh, that, that's an important responsibility. I'm glad that the Department of Defense is stepping up to that. There is a lot of money from the Biden administration uh, through the, uh, being deployed through Department of Defense to make sure that we're making progress in a number of areas, both in what we call installation energy. So what we're using on bases around the world, as well as operational energy. What do we need to feel the force a good example of a high priority project at DIU today is a tactical vehicle hybridization. What does that mean? Uh, taking the vehicles that we use in the Army, so the joint like tactical vehicle, Humvees, uh, you know, which there are thousands in the fleet, and using batteries uh, to basically complement the, you know, the, the, the gasoline or diesel engines in these vehicles. The Army did a study a few years ago that showed that 80% of the time the engine is on, it's idling. So um, somebody's trying to use some other capability. Maybe they're just trying to get warm or cold or, or cool uh, in an unfriendly environment. Whatever that is, uh, we're creating a heat signature. We're wasting fuel. Um, that compromises the supply lines. So we are in a project right now to retrofit those vehicles with batteries. It's uh, something I think will have a pretty big impact if we can reduce the 80% of the time that uh, those are idling. Uh, with battery power, obviously we get uh, a much a much better uh, answer. So that's a big project that's going on right now. There's quite a few other projects to look at uh, synthetic fuels. In the long term, I'm excited about using some much greener fuels like uh, hydrogen, which has the potential to be developed on site. Um, a lot of work to be done to get there, but who better than the world's largest consumer to be leading the way with some of these uh, some of these pioneering technology? Uh, we're looking at new battery chemistries, uh, lithium sulfur chemistry that provides a lot more energy density and is not flammable. You can uh, put a nail through this battery and not have it uh, not have it explode. Think how different that is from lithium ion batteries, which have caused problems in, in aircraft. New shapes for batteries uh, and standardization. So think about uh, what we send an infantry uh, soldier out with today so many different batteries the weight that consumes and the inconvenience of it so we're looking at a project longer term about how do we standardize some of the batteries for department of defense make them uh, more efficient and even look at shapes that could be incorporated in existing gear rather than i have to carry separate battery packs so a whole lot that's happening in this space i think it's very exciting William has a uh, question on horizon scanning. Uh, he is interested to know to what extent DIU is monitoring open source scientific literature to detect innovation by strategic competitors. So William, are, uh, by competitors, I'm wondering if you mean uh, uh, adversaries, like what are we doing to monitor China? Um, well, I'd say more in the wheelhouse of DIU is making sure we're up to speed on what the commercial innovations are. So uh, while we will follow, as uh, many of us are, what's happening generally with quantum or AI in China, 
what we have dedicated resources following is where are commercial solutions being successfully deployed, uh, primarily in the U.S. So we're looking at who are the companies, if we take AI as an example, who are the ones who are the leaders at uh, computer vision? Who are the ones who are the leaders at anomaly detection? Um, uh, a good example, we're re, uh, working with um, uh, the military to redo the National Capital Region uh, aircraft uh, monitoring system. There are cameras that we have in place today that are 20 years old, put in place after 9-11. And we can use computer vision to basically see what's in the air around the National Capital Region. So the combination of uh, new cameras and what can we use, uh, uh, you know, with computer vision to be able to identify that autonomously are going to increase our capability. Just one, one uh, quick example there of what we're doing. Um, so we have folks dedicated, we call it commercial engagement teams, to understand for each of the technology areas we're in, energy, autonomy, AI, et cetera, what are those commercial innovations that are happening? How could we apply those to the military? Terry has a question on um, the interplay between DIU and DARPA. And so specifically, what level of collaboration exists between those two very important organizations? Big fan of DARPA. Uh, Stephanie Tompkins doing a terrific job there. If, if you really look at the intersection of uh, DARPA and DIU, uh, it's really uh, a tangent uh, <laughs> where DARPA has a successful project because they're inventing the future and DIU's mission is what's available today to help warfighters. So it's when DARPA has a successful project that perhaps is becoming a commercial capability, maybe a company is being formed, that's where DIU might be able to take that technology and move it forward. Uh, an example would be uh, DARPA ran a grand challenge a couple of years ago in cybersecurity for automatic detection and remediation of cyber vulnerabilities uh, capability that won that grand uh, that uh, prize challenge uh, is one that we picked up a company called for all secure uh, to put them on contract and uh, help them get more established within DoD interestingly enough when we put them on contract they had competing offers from uh, Chinese investors so it's an important aspect of this to make sure that we in the US, are investing in the technology we developed and not just sending that uh, sending that overseas. So uh, DARPA and specifically has a, a program called the Embedded Entrepreneurship Initiative, uh, how to help the capabilities they've successfully demonstrated move into a different phase where a company could be developed and try and bring capital and some management together to help those ideas actually become uh, commercial uh, capabilities. That's where DIU can get involved to support that initiative and take those companies in that initiative forward and hopefully bring them on as future vendors to DOD. So it's at the, at the tangent where DARPA has a successful program. Here's another uh, international partnership question for you. Uh, this one's from Bob, and he is wondering whether you see potential for DIU to partner with NATO, and he specifically men mentions Diana, uh, the new Defense Innovation Accelerator uh, that, that the Alliance has set up. Definitely. I think that's an extension of what we talked about before with AUKUS. Uh, we're excited about the Diana initiative, and uh, we think there could be a lot more happening with, uh, with our NATO allies. Uh, right now, we don't have the mandate really to do that. Uh, we've, we've asked for that and we don't have the budget to support it. Um, this past year, we unfortunately took a 20% budget cut. I'm excited to say that uh, uh, HASC Chairman uh, Adam Smith has uh, taken an interest, has have many of the HASC members, and we look like we have some great support from them. There's a big improvement in the budget that they've recommended in the chairman's mark for FY23. It's that's an example of uh, supporting NATO allies of some of what we would do with that increased budget um, if we get it in FY23. So there's definitely a lot of potential there. And same things we talked about, sourcing uh, from NATO uh, countries. Uh, one of the uh, competitors that's been very successful with uh, DIU's signature Blue UAS program, how do we have drones that are not uh, made by China or use Chinese components? And a French company, Parrot, uh, we qualified uh, as an example um, and, and uh, made that capability available to both the military and the rest of the federal government. So that's just one example, uh, but there's a lot more that we could do by expanding the DIU solicitations to include companies from NATO countries. 
Here's a question from Patrick Wilson at MediaTek. Uh, Patrick would like to know, based on your time in the building, how do we help the wider DoD community understand better their dependence on innovation in the commercial technology sector? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, I think that uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, there's some visibility for the commercial capabilities we've already developed. So you can see examples of the 50 capabilities we've already transitioned uh, on the website, uh, again, diu.mil. Uh, and in conversations that we have with, uh, you know, senior leadership, I don't think it's a question about realizing that it can help us. I think it's a question of how much resource do we put within DOD that's focused on attracting that commercial capability? Nothing happens in the building without money. So we've got to get more flexible ways of allocating some of that money to uh, commercial projects. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, probably rethink our process on how would we bring that commercial capability inside. So that's where the fast follower strategy comes into play. Those, I think, are the barriers. Senior leaders recognize how important commercial technology is. My boss, again, 11 of the 14 critical technologies for national security that she identified are being led by the commercial sector. So we have to have access to those technologies to make sure we're fielding a, a modern force. It's a question from uh, from Emmy on um, sh she's specifically curious about what the balance of standalone technology is versus important components in larger systems. Uh, so how do you integrate the tech you find into legacy or even emerging DOD systems? Yeah, another uh, terrific question. I think there's a lot of opportunity with our large weapons platforms to really incorporate Congress's intent, uh, which Congress calls that modular open systems approach. So a large weapons platform, rather than being uh, monolithic from one vendor uh, to support one set of requirements for 20 or 40 years, could be thought of as a system of systems where we're recompeting those elements much more frequently, but you have to have a design that allows for that, for the interoperability of those uh, components or subsystems uh, that would operate together. The same uh, kind of analogy would apply to how do we bring commercial technology and have that interoperate with the larger weapon systems. You got to have an architecture for that. So it's got to start from the day you are designing that larger platform. So we rely on the DOD mission partner to do that. They have to think through how will this uh, how will this work? In some cases, like the tactical vehicle hybridization uh, project we talked about before, pretty easy to do because commercial vendors have upgraded their uh, truck fleets for years. So there's a commercial example of how to do that. In some cases, that can be more difficult if it's a more integrated part of a larger system, like uh, using AI software in an existing system as an example. So it's, it's a whole range of how easy that is to do often we have to rely on the mission partner because we haven't been uh, typically involved at the very front end of a design of a larger system. Um, Eric has a question on the debate to reauthorize uh, CIBR and STTR. Uh, Eric would like to know how DIU is informing this debate and are you proposing any changes to the program? Yeah, well, uh, DIU is a bit unique uh, in that the funding we use for projects is RDT&E. So we're not uh, using or benefiting the uh, from the CIBR program. So we're not uh, uh, informing that debate. Uh, I'll just make one comment. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis in the DOD on the CIBR sitter program. And in general, I'm a fan of that program, but that's $3 billion of department spending because the department is spending it because it is pretty reliable source because it's a tax on the R&D that the Defense Department uh, has every year. Um, appropriately, there's scrutiny on, okay, how are we gonna spend that effectively? And I give AFWorks tremendous credit for really pioneering what could be done there. But when we focus so much on that $3 billion, that crowds out some time we could be spending on 350 billion that's spent every year by venture capitalists. If we just spent some of our resources, this is a little bit what I meant before in the answer to the question of what barriers are there. If we spent more of our time at DOD thinking about how we influence the 350 billion, that's three times, three and a half times the R and the record R and D budget that Congress gave to uh, DOD uh, last year and is in the FY23 budget. 
investments, then we would be bringing a lot more investment and potentially capability into DOD. So while I'm a fan of the SBIR program, I think we need to turn more of our attention to how are we working with the commercial investors to make sure we're influencing where that money is spent. And by being good customers, which today I argue we're not a very big customer of commercial capability, but by being a bigger and more frequent customer, we could start to influence uh, where that investment is being made and see that more of it could be spent to support national security applications. So a few folks have uh, have asked this following question, and it's in a nutshell, it's basically make the case for DIU. Why should it continue and why should it grow ideally? Yeah, well, there's never been a more important time to adopt commercial technology into the military. Uh, what I talked about before in terms of the historical perspective, if you go back 50 or 60 years, DOD was developing most of the technology it needed. Um, DOD developed, you know, semiconductor technology, the internet, uh, GPS. That's not true today. Uh, we need the AI, the cyber, the autonomy, the biotech. We need those capabilities. They're being developed outside DOD and they're being developed outside the primes. I'm a big supporter of primes because they do things that nobody else can do but we need a lot more technology capability that's beyond that traditional vendor set and beyond what DOD has developed for itself. That's commercial technology. That's why we need the fast follower strategy. That's why we need the head strategy to be implemented. So we introduce complementary capabilities to the large weapons platforms that, uh, that, uh, that we rely on today. Uh, so if you thought that was important when Ash Carter uh, created DOD, uh, DIU seven years ago, if you fast forward and think about a strategic competition with China, which probably will last multiple generations, um, it's even more important if you think about competing with China, given the question we had earlier about how advanced is China uh, in these technology areas, AI, quantum, autonomy, pretty darn advanced. Uh, just to give one example on autonomy, they have the world's leading company for small drones, DJI, which uh, has had uh, basically 60, 70% global market share. So we don't want to live in a world which is dominated by DJI, Huawei, um, Chinese space companies, et cetera. We need U.S. commercial capability to be successful. So DIU is a window. I'd argue it's not big enough uh, to get that commercial capability uh, to the military. We need more and more uh, uh, organizations within DOD using the same techniques we do. There's no corner that we have on uh, what we're doing, we need that to be much more widely adopted so that we can take advantage of the innovation ecosystem around us, which is the envy of the world, and modernize the force and give our warfighters the most modern capability that we can field. Uh, as many of you know, we as consumers have access to much more compute power, modern communications capability uh, than we give our warfighters. Um, we, we need to fix that. Uh, DIU is one of the tools in DOD's toolkit to to address that. Mike, you've been at the helm of DIU for four years now. What are you most proud of? I'm really proud of the way that we've shown that what was basically a concept uh, for Ash Carter can be operationalized. Uh, kind of a daunting task when he set out seven years ago. Uh, as we know, the first iteration, he came back and redid uh, that he called DIU 2.0. He put a commercial executive, my predecessor, Raj Shah, in charge. And Raj had the insight that we need more than a tech bridge. Uh, Ash Carter's original concept was we're going to bridge uh, with conversations uh, what we need in the military with what's happening in the commercial world. And uh, Raj said, what we need are projects that draw money, uh, or sorry, that supply money to those commercial vendors. That's going to attract their attention. We've taken that and put that on steroids by bringing on our own contracting capability so we could be very responsive and get contracts written in 60 to 90 days. We've more formalized that project process, what, do we, what projects we work on to do what Secretary Mattis asked, to do, asked us to do, transform capability within DOD by bringing in uh, commercial capability. We have a defense engagement team that's constantly scanning for the most important problems so we can have the highest impact. And we have this commercial engagement team I mentioned that is uh, uh, scanning for what are the successful commercial solutions out there, what's happening in the commercial world that we need to bring to the military. We've added to that national security innovation capital, a DIU idea for how do we stimulate more hardware vendors for the future um, so that uh, 
entrepreneurs working on deep tech can get some support from the US military for their ideas, and those can be potentially future vendors. So we've uh, scaled this, as I mentioned before, with 75 projects underway, 50 capabilities we've transitioned, which means production contracts in place, about $5 billion of contract value for those uh, commercial vendors. Um, we've shown we can scale this. It's just not scaled to the extent it needs to be to have a bigger impact uh, at, at DOD today. But I'm very proud of the, the team we fielded and the capabilities that we've brought. I, I forgot to mention, we invented the commercial solutions opening process to leverage other transaction authority. We're now training more people in uh, what we do with something we call a commercial, immersive commercial acquisitions program. Uh, to be able to train other officers from the services in um, basically leveraging other transaction authority. And we've, uh, I think, been a thought leader with uh, uh, putting out there what needs to be done uh, to bring more commercial technology in, head strategy, fast follower strategy. So I'm, I'm very proud of the work that we've done. There's just so much more yet to do. Yeah. Well, clearly your time at DIU has been very rewarding and impactful. It's also a very challenging job as well, of course. What's been the biggest disappointment? I think uh, the fact that uh, we haven't made more progress. So I'm an impatient person. Uh, I want to see is the mission. There's no much more important mission than making sure our warfighters are equipped with the very best. So some of the challenges we've seen on fielding commercial technology, I would like to have seen those go faster, which is why I'm passionate about proposing ideas so that it, it can go faster. And I'm confident that we'll make some more progress under the next director of DIU. Well, on that point, you uh, you announced that you are stepping down from your position on September 2nd. What words of advice do you have for the next DIU director? Critically important mission. Uh, again, we've made a lot of progress uh, and I think we've laid a blueprint for some of the things that can be done uh, kind of in the next phase as we make sure that what we've done gets integrated with more mainstream acquisition. So some of the ideas that we talked about today really are doing that. Expanding to uh, have a much greater outreach to international allies and partners and make sure their technology is included in what we consider. Uh, and if we have the support uh, from the Congress for the uh, increased budget, which the chairman's mark uh, indicates, uh, we'll have the resources to be able to take on that expanded mandate. Well, Mike, I wish you all the best in the remaining time that you have at DIU. It's going to be a very momentous couple of months. I also wish you uh, some well-deserved time off. Uh, that trip to France sounds incredible, so I hope, hope you enjoy that tremendously. And I can't wait to see what you do next, because obviously all your good work is not yet done. I know you'll continue to have tremendous impact on um, the U.S tech and innovation ecosystem, uh, bolstering America's role in the strategic competition, which is very much centered on technology. So thank you very much for your service. Thank you for spending time with us uh, to talk about all these tremendously important issues. And uh, yeah, we just really appreciate you coming back to CNES and, uh, and doing this with us. So thank you. Once well, thanks for those uh, uh, wishes. And I want to compliment the work that CNES does uh, Martin, you and the team there do a tremendous service for the country with the work that you do on national security. So a fantastic think tank, a lot of great products, uh, which I enjoy reading. So I'm looking forward to joining uh, on the other side, uh, being outside DOD and trying to contribute to that uh, body of work as well. But you guys do a phenomenal job. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for the kind words. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, tuning in today. Uh, tremendous questions. I uh, really enjoyed this conversation. And I look forward to seeing you at our next event. And Mike, once again, thank you. And uh, looking forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye now. Take care.